this uh, young man, for instance, a teenager, um, when I asked him, well, who do you speak Spanish with then? And he says, with my grandparents. But he says, hable yo, yo, a ver, yo hable con mi abuela, más de mi abuelo, porque cuando yo hable con mi abuelo, él no entiende, él tiene un problema, es over years, and then he switches to English. So, a few sentences in Spanish, um, very reduced, very reduced grammar. So, children who, and these are all children, uh, all these teenagers and adults that I've spoken with or I have studied, um, have acquired Spanish as their first language. If you ask them what's your native language or your mother tongue, they'll say Spanish. But they soon start attriting, as we say, when there is a process of attrition, loss, or non-development of the language. And you find adults that who can hardly communicate in Spanish. There's another one, Nora. All she says to me when I asked her, but you understand everything I say to you in Spanish? And she says, yes. And I also understand my grandparents and my parents when they talk to me in Spanish. She's uh, 22 now. And uh, I said, well, how do you do that? I ya no sé. That's the only <laughs> thing she said in Spanish to me. And then she switched to English again. And when I, when I finished the conversation with her and I asked her, um, well, maybe I'll come again another time to talk to you in Spanish so I can record you in Spanish. And she said, I've been talking to you in Spanish. Yeah. And she wasn't even aware of it. She said, really? You've been talking to me in Spanish. <laughs> so this is the outcome of lack of dual language education and lack of support for the uh, home language, then uh, the kids are going to not be able to develop them, uh, this language beyond this very elementary knowledge they acquire up to age five or five and a half. Now, one of the problems with uh, bilingualism is that for decades, it was said that bilingualism caused confusion in the mind of the bilinguals, um, that uh, it caused personality problems, that children grew up not knowing who they were. Well, recent uh, research, uh, both in Europe and in Canada, particularly in Canada and Europe, rather than in the United States, but more and more is being done in the United States as well, has shown that this is completely wrong, that it's been challenged and discredited this idea that, uh, that it's uh, uh, a negative um, situation for children to be exposed to two or more languages. In fact, that there's a famous uh, cognitive linguist or psycholinguist, Ellen Bialystok, in uh, Canada, and her daughter, but the attempt for just one little experiment she did, she calls it the Tower Experiment. Uh, and she builds up towers with uh, Lego blocks and with Duplo blocks, right? And the Duplo blocks, I don't know if you're aware of them, those who have children might be, uh, are about double the size of the Lego blocks. So she tells the children that each one of these blocks, be them of any size, uh, contains a family. So look, here we have you know, all these families, and here we have all these families, and then she builds up the, the towers, and the towers are exactly the same height, but one contains more blocks, double the number of blocks when they have Legos in them and, than the other one. And then the question is, or the task for the children is to say which tower contains more blocks, I mean more families, I'm sorry. And the bilingual children at age four can tell immediately without paying attention to the height, which would be a distracting factor, right? That there are more families in this town because there are more blocks. Monolingual children, and these are all experiments that are very well done, very well controlled, and with st statistically significant results. Monolingual children start realizing this at one year later. So the conclusion is that at an early age, bilinguals have not just a social advantage, the fact that they can communicate with parents and grandparents and friends in another language, but also a very important cognitive advantage, right? 
that they are capable of focusing on what is really relevant. They are capable of switching tasks uh, much better than a monolingual because their brains have actually matured earlier as a result of the fact that they have to pay attention to two systems, mm -hmm. two linguistic systems. You know, in my own research, I've seen that the bilingual kids that I've studied um, start using, well, this is very linguistic, grammatical subjects in English at a much earlier age than the monolinguals, than the English monolinguals. Now, I understand Japanese has the same situation in Italian, as Spanish, and that is that we don't need to express subjects in Spanish. I mean, I can say, llegué uh, tarde, I don't need to say, I arrived late. In English, you have to say, I arrived late. You can't say, oh, what a pity, I arrived late. No, you have to put the pronoun. <coughs> now, the fact that these bilingual children are exposed to these two very different languages, typologically different languages, then makes them more aware at an early age that there are different systems. Yeah, of course, this is all subconscious. I mean, we're not consciously looking at grammar. But when comparing them, these bilingual kids, Spanish English bilinguals that I studied, with the results of a study done in New York with 21 monolingual American uh, English uh, speaking kids, um, I see, you know, months of advantage in, in age. Right? Well, it sounds as if your research is really, you know, very um, uh, forward thinking in the field and, and very promotive of the whole idea oh, of immersion oh, education. Oh, so when you have that bilingual, yeah. Early, yeah. At an early age. Right. Well, yeah. we thank you for your enthusiasm and for your research and um, we're really happy to have you with us. So we're going to take this over to Madeline Ehrlich. Okay, some of you already know me in the room, but I'm going to tell you something that maybe you don't know about me. Right, Anne? And, <laughs> Nancy. Okay. Um, I, I, little, I mean, we've all got some diverse backgrounds. First of all, I'm a nurse by profession. Of course, nobody in my children at El Marino or at any time the immersion program, they all thought I was a teacher. Well, let me take you back. I came from a family, a French-speaking family. My parents spoke French, but it was in the 30s and 40s, and it was very un-American to speak another language. So my mother said, I'll speak French to the children, and you can speak English. My father said, oh no, that's not going to be because you know how embarrassing it is to go to school uh, like we did and not speak English. So they spoke to us in English, but we went to a French school and I can say my Hail Marys right now in French <laughs> faster than you can run across the street. Anyhow, but um, as I grew up and I went into nursing school, I realized how important I was a public health nurse and I was out in the field. And how could I tell Mrs. Gonzalez how to take care of her newborn baby unless I could speak Spanish, right? So I added Spanish, you know. Um, I thought, wow, I, I mean, I know how to do this, but I need to communicate. And it wasn't time for me to say, Mrs. Gonzalez, why didn't you go back to school? So it's really funny because also in nursing school and when I graduated, um, you know, they do a class prophecy. The prophecy about Madeline Lane was that she received a $5,000 grant for an orientation program for foreign interns at Cook County Hospital. <laughs> so there was always this connection of how I wanted to promote second language and so forth. I also um, did volunteer work um, with um, uh, Cuban immigrants at one time, um, teaching English, because I thought I, there was something in me, okay, that really wanted to do this. Talking about advocacy, you know, along the way you meet these people that are really you don't say they're an advocate, but they really are. You don't know where it's going to rub off. So as I you know, grew up and I had my own children, I really wanted my children, I didn't care if they knew math, science, or social studies, but they needed to speak a second language. But I was really afraid of putting my son into the immersion program, okay, because of an experience I had had in French um, submersion, okay, and I thought, oh my God, my kid's going to come home. Thank you to a parent who said to me the last day of registration at El Marino, last day of kindergarten, uh, preschool, she said, Madeline, you're putting Stephen into the immersion program, right? And I go, no, Robert, I don't think. She says, yes, you are. She, you're definitely going to get in your car right now, and you're going to El Marino, and you're going to sign him up. Okay. I went over there, and uh, at that time, it wasn't a lottery, okay? There was a paper on top of the, of the countertop, and it was one space left. One. Okay.